So good afternoon, every uh, good afternoon, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm so used to saying good afternoon, but uh, this is how we adjust in Binalo Talk with our informal talk. So for some of you who might not be familiar with the Binalo Talks, uh, this is the this is a weekly talk that's hosted by the Archaeological Studies Program. Uh, we have this every Wednesday. We usually, when it was face to face, we usually have it every lunchtime. So it's mm -hmm. very informal. Uh, and we always have it uh, and we, during the pandemic, we switched to doing this online. But um, take note, as uh, in the next few months, we'll have a new announcement regarding mm -hmm. uh, when and how we'll be reformatting the Binalo Talk. But for now, we're still hosting it online and we're very thankful that we have uh, guests who agree to give talks. Uh, despite wherever they are in the world. <laughs> uh, just a quick, just a few announcements. Uh, I guess for some of the students here of archaeology uh, of ASP, we will the enrollment is, uh, will be going on at the end of October. So you will be receiving some emails from the admin regarding the methods for enrollment for the second trimester. So please watch your emails for that. Uh, for those who will be attending IPPA, there's also a lot of emails that are coming in. Uh, if you still haven't gotten your travel orders, if you're uh, working in uh, the in UP, please get your travel orders. Uh, if you need help, uh, contact the admin uh, regarding this, especially Ara Padilla and uh, Cecil uh, at Cecil. Okay, um, other than that, uh, for today, just a, not announcement, but an advertisement, uh, there's going to be UGAT, uh, the Ugnayang Agham Tao, an, inter uh, at an international conference that's hosted by the UGAT uh, um, Incorporated or uh, the Society of Ar Anthropologists in the Philippines. This will be hosted on site in Marinduque, uh, Barinoki College. Uh, however, it's going to be hybrid and it will be online. If you want to check it out, please visit their website. Uh, the UGAT will be starting today and it will be held within three days. Attendance is free, but if you want a certificate, you will get you will have to pay 500 pesos, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but I think for members, it's for free. Um, so these are only some of the exciting things that we can watch out for this week. Okay. Uh, but for today and for now, we have our great guests with us. We've always <laughs> wanted to uh, to invite Ruchi. I thought that we already invited you, but when I went through our list, I realized that we did we didn't invite you, but we but you were present in some of the yeah, yeah, talks. Yeah. So I always think that you were there. So and yeah. we always had uh, a nice chat after the banana <laughs> and a bit of contemplation after that with coffee yeah, so yeah, yeah. and i guess it's time for us to finally to, to like, finally invite you and when you're already in australia uh, yeah. so ruchi mark pototanon is a phd student at the asia research center murdoch university in western australia he studies the environmental history of southeast asia and he's been working on his thesis on the history of flooding in Ilo City, Central Philippines, which he will be uh, talking about today. He holds a BA in Sociology and History, cum laude, and an MA in History from the University of the Philippines. So aside from the histories of the disasters, he also did research on toponyms, cultural studies, and Austronesian linguistics. Uh, he loves to bike and collecting plants, and I hope that you're <laughs> You can see that he has a lot of plant collection at the back. Um, but if you do visit Western Australia, he'll be happy to bike with you. <laughs> so <laughs> please welcome Ruchi Patatana. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction, uh, Anna. So like, I also would like to thank Ira for and the rest of the Archaeological Studies Program for the invitation. So this is yeah this is indeed like a like uh, a binalo talk that uh, a long time coming. So uh, having been in a contact or like having been friends with people from the ESP for a long time. So um, 
So I'm really happy to be part of uh, today's Binalo Talks. So uh, first, I would like to open my slides. Yeah. My talk is um, titled um, A Disaster with No Name, The Forgotten Flood of 1994. So um, this is part of my uh, PhD thesis on uh, flooding in Iloilo City. So this actually constitutes a chapter. So um, my uh, confirmation of candidacy is uh, due like in three weeks. So as part of the preparation, I would like, of course, to like have a, for, like some sort of a preliminary uh, presentation just to know like how would people react to this kind of topics. So first, uh, I would like to acknowledge, um, uh, to do an acknowledgement of country. So we acknowledge that Murdoch University is situated in the lands of the Wajuk and Benjarib Nunga people. We pay our respects to their enduring and dynamic culture and the leadership of Nunga elders past and present. The Buja, on which Murdoch University is located, has for thousands of years been a place of learning. We at Murdoch University are proud to continue this um, long tradition. This land has is is um is and was and always be our Aboriginal land. Um, so like, uh, proceed. Okay, so here's my abstract. So it's a very prelim preliminary study. So uh, the 2008 flood caused by Typhoon Frank or Function uh, seems to be forever etched in the minds of the people of Iloilo. However, prior to this catast catastrophe, the, uh, the city experienced a great flood in the last days of July, 1984. An earthed reports of this event seem to indicate it is possibly of the same extent as the 2008 floods. But why is it that the 1994 flood seems to be forgotten? This paper rediscovers these sources um, to this pivotal event and puts it into social historical context. Additionally, it explains the possible reasons why it was forgotten. So like uh, first, um, uh, I'd like to uh, replicate like where is Iloilo City? So Iloilo City is a coastal city in central Philippines facing the Iloilo Strait and the Sulu Sea. So it is part of the Western Visayan region and is the capital of the Iloilo province. However, it is a highly urbanized city. So even if it is the capital of Iloilo province, the Iloilo province does not have any like political control or like administrative control over the city. So so it has a population of 457,626, according to the Philippine Statistical Authority uh, from to, uh, in 2020. And it's divided into 180 barangays or villages, grouped into seven districts of Haro, Molo, Manduriao, La Paz, uh, Lapu, City Proper, and Villa. Prior to the, prior to 19, to the 1930s, these... Um, different districts are independent Spanish pueblos, which have, you know, um, which have uh, governments of their own. So that's why when you go to Iliilo, you would find that each district has its own church, has its own plaza, has its own center of identity. And uh, Haro, for example, was already a city, was a separate city from Iloilo City during the last days of Spanish colonialism. Uh, and um, in this map, actually, which shows the district is also a map which shows um, flood flood prone areas or flood hazard zones. So you see there, like uh, Iliilo is yeah, it's a really flood. It's quite uh, you know uh, um, exposed to flooding hazards. Okay, so the city, um, so ninety percent of the city's land mass has an elevation of 2.6 meters above sea level, while the remaining has an elevation of 5.9 5 meters above sea level. So being such, the city has a very low elevation and it's a, it has a very also very low slope. And it's, it's also traversed by four bodies of water, uh, namely the Haro River in black, the Iloilo River, or like more of the Iloilo Estuary, uh, the Dungun Creek, which connects Iloilo River and um, and uh, the Haro River, and the Batiano River, um, which is in uh, here in blue. So you have Batiano, you have Iloilo, you have um, a Haro, and you have Dungun. So these are very important bodies of water 
in Iloilo City. Okay. So, well, first I would like to start with the flood event that's Iliilo is most known for. It's actually still being remembered until today. So this is the flood of uh, June 21, 2008, or the flood that is caused by Feng Shen. Okay. Um, so there are like 21 deaths. There are like, um, so um, the typhoon caused deaths of like 21 people, injured 169, uh, affected 243 persons, and affected 145 out of the 100 villages. Actually, but some reports would say that all 180 villages were uh, were submerged in water. 1,428 houses totally destroyed and around 800 million pesos in terms of infrastructure damage in Iloilo City alone. But of course, this would be a lot more if we would like adjust it to inflation. Um, so... The, one of the problems that exacerbated this design that turned this uh, typhoon or this uh, this event as a disaster was that there was no early warning for floods, and but and by early afternoon, most of the city is underwater, which later left a thick layer of mud. So the city itself is not prepared for floods. There's actually lack of equipment for rescue, for example, for rescue boats, backhoes, payloaders. This even admitted by the city in the early in the early reports. Okay, and there's also a conflict between volunteer groups in 2007, which um, really caused the lack of what you call um, coordination among um, in, in the rescue. So that's why Ilongos or the people uh, living in Iloilo City would remember flood as a very, would remember Frank or to the 2008 flood as a very you know it's a, it's a very gloomy moment in the city's history. And uh, up until later, it will be used as a benchmark for future floods. Like you would say that uh, this flood is uh, reminds us of Frank, and Frank would you know would really become some sort of like a social memory for those who are who have lived in Iliilo during um, the first decade of the twenty first century, but. While, and so that's why uh, when I was doing, I was trying to formulate my um, research proposal, I thought of, yeah, I was focused with on uh, Frank. But I need to, uh, I need, of course, in order to understand Frank, I need to go deeper into the uh, environmental history of the area. So uh, I went to the Center for West Visayan Studies to look at their material. And um, one of the materials that I found was this um, exploratory study of the ecological the ecology profile of Iloilo River? So it's published by it's prepared by the Kaublagan Sang Panimalay Foundation Incorporated. So it's an it's a civic organization. Um, so it's published. It's released August 31, 1995. So uh, because in order to understand Frank, I need to look at past flooding events and. Um, and while I was looking at the documents, I found this one. And then on page nine, there's this discussion of like last, uh, you can see it, last July 1994, the rainfall intensity was something like that. And then, um, so there's data there. But here in the section on flooding hazards, so it says flooding is a frequent phenomenon in Iloilo City, which suffered from serial serious flood damages in 1994. So I, um, what I did then is that I look for, um, because online you could like, say you could type like typhoon 1994 or flood Iloilo 94, but I couldn't find any. So I tried asking people if they remember it, uh, flood flooding in 1994. And then, well, of course, uh, so... Many said they remember Ruping, which is in 1991, or like or other floods like Frank. But when I um, dug deeper into the archives of that of that of the Center for West Visayas Studies, I found this. I finally found this article. Um, this one is from Panay News, which is also in the in the poster for to this talk. Um, so uh, it says city underwater, um, 
So three dead, two missing, 14,000 families displaced. So that's the front page, that's the headline. And you, you find your pictures of different parts of the city that are um, that are flooded or and people in evacuation centers. And uh, you see there is like, it says like um, in some parts of, in Mandoriao, like flood was waist high in some areas. And there's even, um, so if you're going to make a close reading of it, like you have, aside from data on the floods, there's data on um, data on the relief operations, the data on, um, or like the story about the city council um, being asked to hold a special session to declare a state of calamity. And um, interesting on top, on top is this article, What is Monsoon? So this is actually a reprint of the article of, of the of the article encyclopedia article from Grolier's on um, the definition of the monsoon. And there's an editorial note here. Many are asking what is a monsoon after floods um, caused by the monsoon, er, uh, so called spawned by the monsoon rains struck the city. And their queries uh, encourage us to print the following. So uh, because why? Because this uh, devastating flood was not caused by a typhoon and uh, it's just caused by a monsoon. And um, generally, uh, Fili Filipinos in the Philippines, we have a very you know, culturally entrenched uh, system of naming our typhoons, our storms. We name it uh, until, I think, until the late 2000s. They, these are named, these are, these are given like female pet names, like, um, and people would remember these events based on their names. They would say like Ruping, Undang, uh, uh, Uring, something like that. So, uh, so, but this one, there's no typhoon and it's caused by the monsoon. So the newspaper has to explain it, uh, what caused it. And then uh, to look further, I utilize social media, especially Facebook. So there's, so in this uh, Facebook group called Old Iliilo, where people share um, historical stuff or like historical materials about Iliilo, I asked like I asked here, like uh, in the, in Hiligaynon, who has re who still remembers this flood of 1994? And then there were questions like. Is this a very deep flood or like a big flood? And someone even said like, oh, until now, it's still flooding in Iloilo. Like uh, someone said like, oh, this flood was was uh, neck deep. Okay. Uh, and then someone said, oh, we live in this village called Dungun B. And I remember all of that. And then uh, someone said like, oh, I was just, I was just, I was just four years old when this happened. So probably I don't know what's happening. But interestingly, out of the 28 comments, I found four that mistook it for Typhoon Ruping, which happened in the 1990s, which happened in 1990. So like someone asked like, is this with Typhoon Ruping? This is Ruping. And then like, this is Ruping? And then like, ah, this is Ruping. And then it's like someone said, no, this is this is not Ruping. This is because Ruping is 1990. So you see there that many people actually do not remember these floods and mistake it for the 1990 Ruping flood. Uh, but one very um one very helpful person, like uh, I would like to thank uh Mr. Nerio Luhan, who's a who's a journalist based in Iliilo. Um and also an expert in Iloilo history. And he was able to comment and he said like, ah, I remember because we were flood victims. And then I even asked him like, sir, do you even have, um, do you even have other photos? Because I, because some of the photos that I found, that, that I found in the newspaper was his actually. And then like, and then he said, sadly, many of his photos were, uh, you know, were, were, um, were destroyed because of the 2008 
uh, Frank. And then like, and then he said about his article, something like that about, about flood. So you see here that there's this 1994 flood was mostly forgotten or mistaken for something else. So, so this really encouraged me to look further into this event and like um, with conversations with my thesis supervisor, like I really want to devote a chapter on this because why? Because this is a very crucial, like um, Frank, if you remember the data on Frank, it's 100 150 plus villages or barangays underwater. This is almost the same. 100 plus barangays underwater. So it would be helpful if I could compare the two, these two events. But why is it that this event is forgotten? And I, I, I even um, looked at, um, looked at um, like disaster plans from different barangays because someone showed one to me and i noticed that when they in when they go when they write about like say uh significant events or the significant disasters they write about 1990 they write about frank but there's no mention of 1994 and one of those barangays guys is dungun b <laughs> so there's no mention of the 1994 flood even if there's if there is someone who said, ah, oh, this time in Dongon B, and it's obviously, it's, I believe, surely believe that Dongon B was underwater, or like all, all the three barangays that were named Dongon are underwater. Because um, these are very flood prone uh, villages. Okay. So these are other pictures. So these are a close up of the pictures taken by Nerio Luhan. So you see that uh, there's a church there. And there's like um, the old airport was seemed like a lake, okay. And also uh, on on, a, on the article the next day you have um, uh, a report from the mayor uh, from Mayor Malabor, Monsanto Malabor, the mayor during that time that there are fourteen thousand families affected from one hundred thirteen barangays. So it's yeah. So that's why it's 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 a big flood. It's very similar to Frank, but why is it not? remembered at all okay so and uh, another an another article by luhan uh uh tells that the flood death toll was up to was now 10 10 people have perished okay and then um so damage to infrastructure was around 50 million pesos so um see and what what are the developments like aside from this the actual damage that the that this flood has been on um has been on the on the city what are its consequences what are its how this how how why is it pivotal like okay so for me it's pivotal in a sense that it actually caused some changes in attitude with regards to how natural hazards are being looked at. So because of these 1994 floods, you have articles, editorials, like lessons from floods. So uh, this is a very preliminary analysis. But um, you'd see there that the worst flooding in the city and for two and a half days served a peer important um, of worst things to come during the season of monsoon rains. Okay, so, and uh, I, I think I like, uh, so it tries to compare actually Iloilo City with Ormoc. So it tries to compare it with the Ormoc tragedy. Okay, and um, one of the reasons why um, this tragedy happened was that Ormoc and Iloilo have the same problem. There's no forest. Okay. So earlier, uh, because I try, you know, I I, I try to really um, see the link. Uh, there is no what you call it. There is no, yeah. There is no. There is no. There is not much really mention of the connection between flooding and reforestation in the city. Uh, because I also look at 
accounts of the 1991 floods, like the the uh, the 1990 floods, I mean of Ruping floods, and compare it with um like and uh, com- and then uh, look at how it influenced things. Um, there was in 19 in, the, in 1991. There's actually a call to reforest uh, Maasin watershed, but there's not. You know, there's no mention of the city at all, okay, or the city government. But here in 1994, after the 1994 floods, you would see that there is now a public clamor and even a clamor coming from the provincial government to engage the city in the reforestation attempt in the in the reforestation programs to um to reforest Maasin watershed. So here in this article. Uh, uh, Ilo Governor Arthur Defensor is soliciting 100,000 pesos from the city government to finance the first series of tree planting in the Maasin watershed. So there is actually there is now um, okay we would not, we would want the city to add to um to help this because now you experience this flooding of 1994. And the only way you could prevent this flooding is you if you would help us. But Maasin is around 80 kilometers away from the city. So it's uh it's not it's not part of the city's borders. But now uh there is an increasing what you call this, there's an increasing awareness that in order for the city to be flood free, it should uh, take care of its hinterlands, of its of its watersheds. Okay, next slide. So and and because of that, uh, there would be um, like save maasin something like a save maasin movement, which was which was participated by not just um, the provincial government and the maasin. Maasin is a town in northern in uh, maasin. Maasin is a town north of Iloilo City. So, but also people, organizations based in the city now helps now help with um with the reforestation. Like for example, um you have here that uh the Florete group of companies uh which own several businesses like media, uh jewelry, real estate, um uh, help. Uh, members of the media task force of environment and uh, even like a thousand um, college students or the reserve officer training course helped in the in this uh, the tree plating day and the metro Iloilo water district uh, which provides uh, the water for for Iloilo city also gave food and gasoline for the tree planters so you see there that there's now this increasing um there's this increasing uh concern towards Maasin after the 1994 flood because after the 1990 flood it's oh, it's most just mostly saying uh, as, uh Maasin is dying like ma- the watershed is dying and there's no there's not much discussion on like how the city can help or how the people from the city could help. Okay. So, okay, so it was a success. So, um, not really a success, but the thing is like, they were able to push through with this uh, replanting of uh, the Maasin uh, watershed. So you see here a picture of Governor Defensor, uh, Governor of Iloilo City. But the thing is like, this is even like, um, there were issues, political issues that were raised because Mayor Malabor was actually absent in this uh, in this event, and but he would say no, I I was absent because I have to go to Manila to get more funds for for recons- for rehabilitation, something like that. So um, so now it has become a recognized say endeavor for all for politicians for the gov for governments and even even for like civil society. To save, um, to save uh, the Maasin watershed. Okay, so aside from that, also some issues that were come that were uh, that emerged was that 
concept of price control because uh, there uh, it is believed that there are some business people who are trying to take advantage of uh, the disaster. So uh, Mayor Malabor has to create an uh, Ilu City uh, Price Coordinating Council. So um, it's interesting that um, if you're going to look at uh, recent reports or like recent aftermaths of flooding incidents, especially major flooding disasters in Iloilo, there's always a price, price control. So uh, uh, there's always a price control, um, the need for price control. Uh, but I think another interesting thing is like, this is an article by uh, Neri Luhan, again, about the, um, about this um, image of the Virgin Mary crying blood. Okay. So, and this was, you know, this, and this is also coupled with another miracle in a closed town of Barotac Viejo, I think. Yeah. So, and this, uh, this happened just a few days after, after the, after the 1994, uh, after the 1994 um, flood. And the thing is, like, I, I'm looking at all I've look I've looked at all newspapers from the 1990 to 1994, just trying to look for significant floods. But this is the only flooding incident in which this kind of events would follow, in which there is a, some sort of miracle. So we uh this is a very I think this 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 event should should be like uh, revisited. As to like how uh, certain events would reveal about the you know the people's psyche after after a devastating disaster. Okay. So yeah. So how can I say like again that this flood was forgotten? Well, because like if you're going to look at articles on Frank, it always says that. Frank is the worst flooding experience in the region. Okay, so these are two articles by uh, Nestor Burgos, one from the Philippine Daily Inquirer and another from the News Today about reporting about uh, the 2008 floods. So you see there that it always says that this is the worst flood or the worst typhoon ever. And I'd like to I'm really curious why is it that the 1994 flood never emerges, like even in official documents. Um, I tried to look at documents on the 1994 floods, uh, on, on uh, the documents on, I mean, on like Iliilo flood infrastructure from 1994 to 2008, there was no mention at all of the 1994 flood. But, if you're going to go back to studies that supported that supported uh, this flood infrastructure, like this exploratory exploratory study of the ecological profile of Iloilo River, there's the mention of 994 flood, but it seems to have been forgotten. Like after 1990, by 1995, there will be talks about Reforesting maasin, but no more talk about the 1994 floods. And so on, 1994, 1996, 1997, 1998, 1999, up to like 2008, there's no mention of the 1994 flood. Of like how, on how in the first place, like for me, like, it, this is this is the flood that has awakened the city. That has awakened the city. That has brought the city into senses. Like, oh, we must do something. But why is it forgotten? Okay, so I pros possible explanations, but these are very very temporary. Uh, like, so why is it forgotten? Number one, because it's not caused by the typhoon, and the thing is like. Since typhoons are named, it's an unnamed event. It's just called as the flood of 1994 or the monsoon flood. But every year there's monsoon. 
and in 1994, I believe so, there are several floods. Like, like three weeks, four weeks after that flood, there's another flood in Haro. Okay. So, which leads to the second possible explanation. There are other flood events that follow that supersede that supersede its intensity, like the 2008 floods, or even the floods of 1997, 1998, something like that. The floods of 2000, 2001. So these floods where, you know, if you're going to think of it like as files, it was relegated to the bottom of the pie. <laughs> so it was, you know, disaster. Uh, and and I and I've really observed this uh, while reading about the history of disasters, especially on accounts of disasters. The memory of the the memory or the historical memory of disasters is only as good as the most recent disaster. And uh, I think the slot that was occupied now by Frank as the greatest flood Iloilo has ever seen. Uh, used to have been occupied by the flood, by this flood. But the thing is, like, did it really occupy a space in social memory in the first place? Like, why is in 1995 there's no talk anymore? Like in 1996, there's no talk more, there's no more talk about it. Aside from this that ecological study on the on the profile of the Iloilo City River or the Iloilo River. Like, I don't, I couldn't find more any more mention like the thing is like even in 2000s you would even read you would even read about like Ilo, Ilo officials talking about or more but not about this 1994 flood okay so this kind of flood was yeah is crucial because it unraveled issues concerning the city so the issue of drainage the issue of reforestation and even the issue of settlement but most especially, the lack of funds to create infrastructure and to make, make, to make all these three possible approaches to flood, uh, to flood risk possible. Because aside from this ecological profile, there's also this study uh, on, um, let, me, let me stop share for a while. So there's there's also this other study on um, like a nationwide a, a nation a nationwide study on floods in the Philippines and like how can they be controlled by rivers and it's also written in ninety it's also uh, done in 1995 but the thing is um, yeah which um supported which 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 support which uh supported um yeah yeah so this file okay yeah so it talks about the Ililu river so this would be you know this study would support the building of floodways, the Haro floodway. But, you know, it's as early as 1995. There's also there are already suggestions for an Ilo Ilo floodway. But they only begin building 2006 and eventually finished by late 2010. Why? Because the city has no money. It has, it has no money to, to uh, contribute for the, the because Japan uh, JICA is only able to sponsor like a portion of it. The city has to contribute, but the city does not have even the money for it. And uh, most especially, the city doesn't even have the money for things like resettlement, which was a precondition that was given by JICA to finance these projects. So you see there, um, this um, event. Really, unravel, uh, really unraveled a lot of things. But still, until now, yeah. Uh, I, I myself don't know how to explain. Or like, I, I, still, I am still grappling 
for answers on why this flood is forgotten? Is it just simply because it has no name? The thing is, the more we forget, like uh, the um, when we forget, when 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 we forget these events, uh, we also forget the lessons, and perhaps we lose track of like. We, we we might lose tracks of uh, how uh, of of how to respond to things because for one um, we are creatures of habit something like that. <laughs> like we only our set of responses depends on what we know and what we know we usually base it on experience and um, yeah so uh, there's always a need for disaster for history of disasters to we or for for disaster studies themselves like this the the field of disaster studies has to peruse more more historical methods more historical approaches in understanding uh phenomena because um without history it would be difficult to understand say for example why would why would fit cities fail uh fail to plan why would uh, people respond this way in spite of and despite of uh, like say lessons or, ad or advice or strategies that are present? So yeah, um, so this is a very open, uh, this is uh, I'm opening, I think I, I hope I opened more questions rather than answers because you know, um, uh, doing environmental history is really a group effort. <laughs> so it's not, um probably i because i only focused here mostly from one source so i'm still looking for other sources but the thing is you know it's quite hard to do archival work you know it's even hard in the thing is like it's even harder to do archival work in the last decades because of uh the fact that earlier accounts are now digital but this one not really so i hope um I hope uh, you enjoyed my presentation. <laughs> so thank you for your attention. So I, I'll be I'll be open for questions for more questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you for that, uh, Ruchi. And for everyone, you can type in your questions at the chat, and we will read it out. If you're feeling shy, you can directly message me or Arawan, uh, username here, uh, and then we'll read out your question. Um, or you can press the reactions button at the bottom of your screen and press raise your hand, raise hand so we can call you and we can, yeah. uh, you can ask questions. But this is, uh, but thank you for that, Ruchi. I I'm actually, I actually have some uh, questions already here. Um, yeah. And I think it's also interesting regarding this concept of forgotten uh, flood and I guess it's something that uh, a, a lot of us, uh, it makes me think about the other types of flooding that uh, that yeah. may already have been forgotten as well. Uh, <laughs> and um, and I was thinking, and in, in, there was also the, what we noticed, especially with the chats that I was having at the background. Uh, there is a short, dare we say a short memory regarding yeah. this. Blood. Uh, there was a comment here. They just rehabilitated, and in, within a year, it's already deforestated. Uh, what happened? Why? Why is that? <laughs> what is is it? Uh, is it because of a political change or something? And maybe it's also as I suggested. Um, is it also possible? And this is happening as well in Marikina. The, the, yeah, the yeah. population repopulation of the subdivisions that were uh, yeah. affected by floods. A lot of the population were being were already left and sold their property. Yeah. So it's being replaced by people. By new people. By new people <laughs> who haven't experienced that flooding. That yeah. So when 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 this area should have been like declared hazard zones, like new build new build zones in this area. Yeah. <laughs> and. And I and I was thinking that even after the the Marikina one, the Marikina River flooding a few years ago, I mean the the mall, the Riverside Mall didn't even close. Yeah. Um, uh, 
so is it just uh is it resilience <laughs> and what's her take on it you know you know you know the thing is like um we are very rational people like humans are very rational people but the thing is like uh the the, the thing the thing um the thing we the, the the thing we remember it the way we remember it, like the way we reason out of course varies like we are a very reasonable people but our lines of reasoning are not the same so you get what i mean so like and it depends usually on the values that we have and so uh, most i think the reason why it seems like not people are not learning about living in these high risk high hazard prone areas is that what are the choices like what are the choices that are available to them to to live um so we there is not there is not really and and you know uh, there's this always um uh, thinking like okay uh Floods like this would always be called like uh, a 30-year flood, a 40-year flood, 50-year flood, a 100-year flood. And people would rationalize, oh, it only happens in it only happens in 100 years. It only happens in 50,000 years. But that's not actually a point. <laughs> it means that it could happen in 100 years, but it could happen more frequently. And with climate change, all these, you know, all these statistical probabilities are being thrown off the, you know, thrown off the boat. Like you have, you're having more and more frequent typhoons, more a stronger, like stronger rainfall and stronger winds. So like what would become, uh, what was like a hundred thousand year flood now or in like a century ago or 50? five decades ago is probably a one yeah. in 20 year flood now. So, but you know, people would always find reasons to, to negotiate or like say to argue with the knowledge that is being presented to them. Because of course, they would have their own values. Like, uh, and that would really matter on the choices that they make. And the thing is like, uh, I would like to quote like George Morens. Um, he has a very, he is a very, you know, very um, art, uh, very um, statement, very glaring statement. If you expect, if you, if you, um, if there's a tendency for people to make, like for ordinary people to make unwise decisions. It's also like if, if it's like un the unwise decisions, the 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 the, pr the probability to make the, to make unwise decisions among ordinary people is not any different than the probability for people in power to make bad decisions. So like, <laughs> so like, um, and sometimes the so thing is like, out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So like, if you are if and those planners, those who plan, those who create policies, those who, those those who those who make decisions, okay, they are sometimes even more prone to creating bad decisions because, of course, that for one, they are not primarily exposed to the risk, so they don't have first-hand information. Second, of course, there's the, the power relations in which they would could be shielded to actual, from actual information, which prevents them, of course, from deciding, from making you know, valid same decisions, scientific decisions. So, yeah, um, we because people make choices, and sometimes the only choice that they could make, or the choice that they make, is to live with that, is to live close to these hazards, and that explains why we like why people still live there in those areas that are hazardous. So, because they make a choice. But of course, their choice sometimes is not wholly their own. It's the choice of those in power, of those who control their access to housing, access to social services, access to employment. 
Yeah. 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 Uh, on that note, uh, although there's some questions coming in, I, yeah. with what you just mentioned, uh, I, I know a geologist uh, who was also saying uh, before that when, when you buy a prop property in the Philippines, uh, it's just a choose your own adventure. What kind of yeah. disaster do you want? Do you want? Can you just survive? Do you volcano? Want a, volcano? Volcano? Earthquake, flooding? Oh, choose your own adventure. Na na. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's a question here on the chat by June Carl Balais. Um, yeah. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Other than this 1994 flood, which other forgotten... Which other forgotten disasters in the Philippines can you compare it with? Are the circumstances of these other forgotten disasters similar with the 1994 Iloilo? Ah, uh, uh, well, I uh, well, because I only look at Iloilo and I look at flooding. I'm not really familiar with other, uh, with other disasters or like other um, natural, what you call this, natural phenomena in the Philippines that have the same circumstances. Uh, but I, I guess like sometimes there are really, you know, natural hazards that are just forgotten. Like uh, I remember when I was 2017, 2000, 2000, 2007, 2008, like um, uh, because I live in Capiz, I'm from Capiz, uh, there's actually a tornado that passed by our house, but it was it never got into the news. Wow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, there was a tornado. Like, like all my all my neighbors, their houses, like some of the like the the huts, some of the huts were really collapsed. Like, um, one of my relatives, her the iron grills of her gate got twisted. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah, there's there was, it was a tornado, but there was no, uh, there was no post-disaster analysis of yeah, them. Yeah, nobody. Not, people, people, from, people from the from the from the town hall did not even go there. Ah, okay. So there was no, because there was no this, there was no uh, analysis of how much it cost. Yeah. There was no yeah. death. There was yeah, no yeah. Money. So I guess. It's forgotten. <laughs> yeah. So it's, uh, the, the concept of memory is that somebody has to, there has to be yeah, has to write it, has to remember it. Yeah. yeah. So that's okay. why I, I think the, in the time of social media, like, you know, you know, for my research now, I'm really happy that I live in the time of social media because like whenever I like, okay, because I'm looking at flooding, so like, okay, uh, how do I know if there's flooding in this period? I'll just go to Twitter or go to Facebook, type flooding, Iloilo, click search, and then I would look at social media posts. If there are reports of flooding, could it be like torrential flooding, or like flooding caused by typhoons? Yeah. So so now now okay. So I think we okay. It's probably part of our bias as like current gener the current generation. So are very much uh, involved in technology, the use of the internet and the social social media. That things like this was very unthinkable, like forgetting about this event is something that's unthinkable, diba? Uh, like, now, you would remember your first day of school, first day of, like, because Facebook reminds you. At my picture, kana. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, your, your picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, I, I think, yeah, I, I, I just had, I just had, a, like, you know, uh, an idea now. Like, even, like, a moment. Like, probably the reason why I'm so, I'm so, what you call this? What's the right term? I'm not happy why this is forgotten because I actually come from the generation, a generation which actually tries to remember everything. Yeah, and yeah. this was in a period in which like people just, you know, try to live today and then something bad happens. If they survive, they live for another day. Yeah, yeah. And it got written down, right? So Yeah, but it got written down. But yeah. of course, you have to remember that newspapers are, especially at this time, in the early 90s, it's a, it's a, it's usually, uh, within you know within the within the access of like for one, you have to be literate. Mm -hmm. 
Number two, yeah, you need to afford newspapers. Number three, you need to have time to read newspapers. Yeah. And it's in English. Right? Yeah, and it's in English. Yeah. yeah. So like, yeah. So the the connection between memory and disaster is a, you know it's a, it's a very interesting one um and especially that you have to also to look at memory as something that is mediated yeah it's a social especially in disasters is that just, yeah it's a social it's social event yeah. like mm-hmm. yeah so the the role of media the role of technology in making us remember Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I think there are other questions. There's a men, there's a, a comment here. I've been from Francie to Bungbanwa. Yeah. I have been visiting Iloilo for the past few years recently. I witnessed the regularity of flooding in various parts of Iloilo province. The roads now are wider and cemented, so I think people are so used to flooding already. Yeah, they're they're actually used to flooding. But the thing is, yeah, I think uh, there's no question that they are used to flooding. But I, this is one thing like I that. But my question is like, why is this 2000 and you know 2000 this 1994 flood is being you know is quite forgotten? But but I think this also uh takes us back to what we were talking about before. Yeah, yeah. Start, but... talking about. So I think yeah. that probably like, the the role of also of like access to information. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Because and... yeah, uh because until now Frank is still being featured like in 2020 in 2000 in 2020 AUP Visayas and the Iloilo City government has a, had a flood summit. And still mm-hmm. Frank emerges from the conversation. And that is like how many 12 years? Mm-hmm. 12 years since it happened. So it still emerges in the conversation of like how should the city because um but that but those but uh but these resurgences would usually emerge after, say, for example, floods in other parts of the country, like The, the the in 2020 the, the floods in Cagayan Valley okay so that's act that actually triggered uh, some sort of like remembering of Frank in Iloilo maybe it's also a matter of replacing it uh since this is more recent uh yeah. generations yeah. are also being changed politicians i don't know if the politicians also changed I, we read yeah. this art the I was having a conversation with someone that one of the articles that you pointed out, Alcala, the department yeah. of uh, uh, there was a headline at the one part of yeah. the newspaper saying that Alcala, the department of uh, environmental, I guess the DNR at that time, yeah. was challenging the people to scuba dive with him. But <laughs> ano <laughs> so. Maybe I don't know what. Maybe that's also one of the reasons he was replaced. So people yeah, got yeah. replaced, and Frank uh, emerged yeah. as more. Well, prominent. well, the thing is, like for Frank, uh, the mayor of Frank, the mayor of Iloilo during that time is Jerry Trenas, and Jerry Trenas is still mayor of Iloilo City now. So um, yeah, yeah. So. Uh, Yeah, but the thing is like how, so it's actually you know, uh, quite one of the things like, the things like uh, how, if we are going to look at disaster memories as, ang tawag dito, uh, like flashcards in a slot, naka slot, may or file in a file cabinet, like, like documents in a file cabinet, and. Um, We replace it when something when a bigger flat file comes in. Uh, Ilo Ilo really has to, you know, uh, Ilo Ilo really has to look back It's because uh, the uh, Frank is the last greatest worst flood. Okay, uh, Ilo Ilo was spared during the time of Yolanda. Southern Iloilo was spared. Iloilo City was spared. It was Iloilo's uh, Ofel. It was also spared. Uh, Ofel, Glenda, 
So like it's 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 really uh if if uh, you really look at the newspapers after Frank, the headlines would always be like Ilo Ilo City spared by Othel. Ilo Ilo City escapes Yolanda's wrath. Okay. So, <laughs> talagang, and, and, it's also the base talaga. <laughs> yeah. So because Ilo Ilo is the center of the region. So like everything is about you know, it's about Iloilo. But the thing is, like, if if there's this exactly. much concern, there's mm-hmm. much attention that is given to Iloilo since, ty- since centuries ago, mm-hmm. why is this event being forgotten? Mm-hmm. Also. There's, uh, there's a comment here uh, directly messaged to me. Is it because our government's decision-making is very political most of the time? There- yeah. No sustained effort to address the flooding, and Governor Defensor did not support uh, Bongbong Marcos in the last elections. Iloilo Province expects 600 million cut in 2023 IRA. Uh, I haven't checked about that because mo- mo- my date, my I'm focusing on Iloilo City. Yeah. So well, 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 well. The thing is, yeah, it's it's a possibility that there are, uh, there's you know, there's the importance of like political alliances and uh, well short of a better term political patronage in making sure that um, projects push through so but this one is um, you know I am yet to look at the relationship between say Mayor Malabor and the national government uh, because unlike, because unlike say for example J- Mayor Jerry Trenas, um, at yeah, uh, Mayor Mayor Trenas at the begin at um when he took over as mayor and facilitated the building of the flood control the flood control project the Ilo flood control project, he always cites his um you know uh, strong relationship with. Um, with national officials like Senator Drelon and former President Gloria Macapagal Arroyo, but you don't see that with um, you don't see that with uh, Mayor Malabor. So I think that also that also matters like how how the city like the city officials relates to say those people in the in the higher ups and uh, and. Yeah, there, there's a really, there's really a strong yeah, and even like during the time of Jed Mabilog, there's also strong involvement with uh, Franklin, with, uh, Senator Franklin Drilon in uh, in uh, flood mitigation projects. So, yeah, it it it's really it's really influ- It's not something that you can discount. It's yeah. not something that you cannot you cannot ignore the role of like say politics not just politics within the city but politics outside the city mm-hmm. in yeah. you know in in influencing policies mm-hmm. uh or like uh in influencing policies and projects that relate to these environmental hazards to flooding etc yeah uh, and i guess it also depends what type of what lens you're using when you're discussing disasters as well yeah um, yeah there's another question here uh you mentioned uh oh, okay uh are there uh, evidences of other disasters and flooding based on the uh on names of the towns yes uh well uh but the thing is like the problem if well i i did i did my work on toponymy or my master's in toponymy and the thing about toponymy especially if the name is like a native name is that you don't know when it's given <laughs> like you don't know it's when it's being coined you just assume yeah. it's pre-colonial so unlike say unlike say um unlike say you so you cannot really put like exact historical Exact historical, what you call this, you can pin it like, oh, this is yeah. happened in 1850 something. Yeah. But it, yeah, because most names actually in the Philippines, especially native names, are reflective of geography. Mm-hmm. And that is why there's an important, there's an important, it's important that 
no matter how many times we change the names, we need to remember the old names because it gives us the idea of the original the original uh the original physical um characteristics of that area so like for example the word the name haro comes they say or also call it the name haro is said to have come salo which means both river and to submerge <laughs> which is quite up since the Haro River has submerged the town of Haro for for centuries like even like early early colonial times and even some barangays in uh, some barangays in uh, Iloilo has have their names like uh, barangays or villages named Danao and Danao is meaning a lake because it floods there and there's what this one uh, village named nabitasan nabitasan means to um means to to be separated because what happens is that when um when the iloilo river floods nabitasan becomes an island so it's separated from from the from the from the mainland uh there are also like uh, other other ta- other villages like um buhang okay buhang is the native term for erosion to erode so okay like, yeah so, so you, you, there are a lot of like in Ililu, you would find a lot of names actually so i i, I guess maybe maybe worth i'm not now i'm thinking about yeah, it yeah. We're thinking about it in, in a different way uh, yeah, yeah. regarding the uh, short memory but so this is long mem this topic long memory yeah. this, this is a long memory but the method of mem- memorializing is different it's yeah it's not on the on b- being talked about yeah but maybe the disaster the 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 lack of memory of it or the inability to speak about it talks about either the the fresh the intensity of the disaster or the yeah. continuous the continue the continuity or seasonality of this these yeah. disasters or these events to the point that it's nothing to be it doesn't have to be talked about maybe yeah. that's uh, I, I think i think one reason is that usually when a name is given to a place if it's because it refers to something that is very usual is mm-hmm. either permanent or very you know very seasonal very frequent mm-hmm. and um uh, well you, we now go to post you know go to uh post call again <laughs> uh our settlement patterns are very much different <laughs> mm-hmm. the settlement patterns prior to colonialism or to colonization is a lot different is a lot different than what has happened during the you know the spanish colonial the spanish colonial period the american colonial period and at, up to now where we become let's say a modern republic so these hazards have long existed like but the question of how as a people how did we react and modify these hazards did we did we uh, eliminate did we mitigate or did we exacerbate yes but yeah. i think also something that maybe that's also something that we can also look into in terms of uh yeah. in terms of instead of just looking at it as simply simply as the resilience so yeah yeah, yeah. the concept of uh of long term memory or short me- short term memory yeah so, yeah I don't know. Is has there been a study on uh people the concept of mem- memory? Say, me- yeah. Memory. Actually, I I've been looking for like studies on disaster memory, but uh-huh. since yeah, but since disaster like environmental history and more so like history of disasters is a very relatively new discipline. There's mm-hmm. not much really, so much of its um. Uh, much of its methods it has to get it has to get from other disciplines 
like anthropology, archaeology, yeah. ecology, and uh, even economics and sociology. So it's it's a it's a, it's a really you know it's a it's a it's it's still grasping you know grasping for sources of of uh, of of uh, interpretation and sources of ideas. Because like if you're going to look at environmental history, environmental history only emerged in the 70s. It's mm-hmm. a field. And when it emerged, it's mostly white people, white men writing about white places. Yeah. That makes <laughs> so sense. like mm-hmm. the concept there, most of the topics are not really focused on, say, the precarious tropics mm-hmm. that we are living that we are in right now so the, the method, so methodologically uh the discipline has has uh is too young so it's not it doesn't have this you know clear cut ways of doing things like it does not have this kind of tests it does not have kind this you know uh analytical frameworks to go with Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that I guess that's a goal of your. Yeah, that's the goal. <laughs> that's the goal of my thesis, like how to how to make sense, like yeah, and 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 I'm focusing between this, like how how from 1994, what are what are the consequences of 1994, and how does it relate to 2008? Because the thing is, should it be that since we experienced 1994? Iliilo should be prepared better with 2008. But yeah. 2008 is still a disaster, right? And now we're just waiting for, for another disaster to, to happen. To measure it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But of course, to be fair, Iliilo has become a very proactive city in terms of disaster risk reduction and mitigation. But the thing is, yeah, but yeah, but you always, we, you know, disasters... Disasters are always surprises. Like you, you cannot, you know, you cannot pick yeah. when disaster will hit you, how it will hit you. Like Ilo's prepared for like lots of typhoons. Mm-hmm. It prepared for Ophel. It prepared for Glenda. It prepared for it prepared for Yolanda. Mm-hmm. But it was it was fine. And the thing is, the problem is sometimes. It could be counter. It could be actually it could be counterproductive, or uh, it could be counterproductive if, uh, if people prepared for something, and then it did not reach to that certain level of disaster. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then they let their guard down. So there are studies that show that kind of that kind of um. That kind of tendency, like in Margaret Cook's uh, work on the Brisbane, on Brisbane, Queensland, mm-hmm. on the um, on the Brisbane River, that that yeah, happened, yeah. like because in the 1990s there are floods. Okay, so their last memory of flood, the 1984, I think, flood. That's the the last greatest flood, and then there were small floods in between. And then they would be like, okay, we can probably let our guards down because there's not, you know, there's not, there's no flood of that level that's gonna hit us. And probably there's none in the future. Probably we are two dams because they have, they have, uh, they have, uh, they, uh, they have two dams that are Somerset and uh, Windhover. That were built to tame the the Brisbane River system. So probably these two dams have worked for us, and it will work for us in the future. But here comes the summer of 2010, 2011. So they were caught by surprise. And then you just have to keep up with it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So like so sometimes, I, yeah. I'm sorry, you you were saying. Yeah. So, so disaster memory is very, you know, it's a very, it's a very interesting, and very complicated at the same time. 
notion because like ah uh, you know um for one disasters are depressing disasters are hurtful as much as we want we would like to forget disasters but the thing is if we completely forget like what happens when there you have many disasters in between two big disasters we let our guards down and that's when hazards of a particular level become disasters because hazards are there they're there everywhere but how we actually uh, uh, respond to these hazards would um, constitute whether that hazards, wh- whether those hazards would unravel as disasters. Yes. So it's a, it's, it's a, it's a very, you know, uh, yeah. That's why uh, when you said like um, that, that anecdote about like living in the Philippines is a choose your own adventure. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, and you know, sometimes it's a combination. Yeah, this could be so a combination. Be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, after flooding, maybe you can put in a, something else and earthquake. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So, so, because disasters, disasters are not, you know, disasters are not isolated ones, uh, are not isolated events. Um, disasters, um, the effects usually come in pairs or so because why um disasters disasters by definition really involves uh, a breakdown of social uh social so, social structures uh like uh, patterns of behavior patterns of activities so this these uh these are the core of human collective behavior, collective identity, something. So if this gets affected, it will have repercussions on other aspects of, of human life. Like, for example, in, um, in I'm reading accounts of the Buffalo, of Buffalo Creek incident in mm-hmm. the United States. It even affected their sex lives, something like that. Yeah. Like, after, like, after, like after the flood, uh, there are couples that, feel that they're no longer, you know, they're no longer in the mood to be to be active, to be sexually active. So you see, disasters are really complex, really complex events. And that's why we also need to have complex approaches towards disasters. Because we do not, uh, even if it's just say, okay, we even if we are able to say prevent deaths like like in the case like uh like in the case of like in 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 developed countries they're able to prevent deaths but it also has effects on their say on their emotional and their you know there there are cases there are cases of high cases of like mental distress after after these events even if not losing your even even if you are say you don't lose a loved one or so but uh as like uh at, as sky erickson would um say in his in his work on buffalo creek uh po- disaster experiences have you know uh undergoing a disaster is uh having to go through two kinds of trauma you have the personal trauma and you have the collective trauma. So, uh, and uh, the collective trauma is actually worse because it's actually lingering. And um, and this is very true, like in, in, uh, in uh, you know, highly catastrophic events, like, like uh, what happened in Tacloban because of Yolanda, what happened in Ormoc in the 1990s, what had happened in places like Ginsa Ogon. So, in which like entire communities were wiped out. These are very, you know, these are, these are, these would live, uh, this would live um, in people's minds for years. And it will really seep through into the consciousness, not just one, not just one of gener- one generation, but also future generations. That's why it's very important that, that we learn from historical accounts of disaster but not just we learn but we also act yes 
okay, based on these lessons and, uh, you know, create uh, new approaches in order to prevent these disasters from happening. Because, yeah, it's, uh, you know, disasters are always surprises. Like, yeah. if you can prepare for a disaster, it will not be a disaster anymore. Yes, and one death is one death too many. Yeah, oh, and one death too many. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, with... um. The thing is, like with climate change, really, with the uh, exactly with the erratic, you know, erratic weather changes, uh, it's it actually adds to the element of surprise. So, w- what we are up to is, you know, so sometimes, like, uh, like uh, Richard Grover would say, um, there's this tendency for environmental historians to be. To be cachapeas, to be like uh, foretellers of, you know, foretellers of the bad news. Yeah. But, well, that's part of the lesson of history. Um, although, yeah, they say you can never, you can never step on the same river twice. No, history does not repeat itself. But, you know, history that does, does not repeat itself, but sometimes we commit the same mistakes over and over again. Ganda ng ano, uh, para sa tao to remind ourselves that. Yeah, yeah. Yes. It's a, I think it's also, I guess, one of the things that uh, uh, we can also, I guess, remember the meme rin na lumabas na behind every a uh, disaster is a scientist na hindi pinapakinggan. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <There's> so, not... <laughs> because there's really, you know, there's really a lot of, yeah, uh, the thing is that, yeah, scientists would always say this is a bad thing, this is what to happen, but, you know, not all the time people would listen. Mm-hmm. Because, uh-huh. of course, they also, they hold, they their values would not be the same as scientists yeah. and yeah. Uh, I or, think, yeah. or one thing I think one thing is also like uh, there is a greater need now I think uh, uh, we have discussed this for a long long time with the, some people on social media the role of science communication mm-hmm. oh yeah. very much yeah the role of science communication why because uh, scientists are usually uh, separated from, you know, from, from the public. Yes. Yeah. So there's always a need to bridge this, this gap between the people and the scientists. Why? Because it's the people who would, you know, who would usually suffer the consequences. And also at the same time, the scientists also need the people because the scientists, well, in a speaking in a very Marxist way, it depends on the people for for their food, for their you know the modes of production. Like scientists are intellectual producers, too, but they don't usually produce their own food. They don't produce their own clothes, you know, than that. And that with that is what scientists or scholars should should be aware of. Why there is a necessity for them, why there's an absolute necessity for scientists to be able to communicate and to be able to, you know, advise towards better approaches to certain things. So, uh, and environmental history is a very, you know, uh, environmental history, its, its origins lie in the environmentalist movement. Yeah. So it's just and it's new. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there and in that note, actually, uh, we're almost uh, at eleven thirty. Yeah. The same time for you, but on yeah. that note, uh, b- based on what you mentioned, I for other people who might be interested, there's a talk uh, last July twenty twenty one in Binalo yeah. Talks as well. Uh. The use of physical physically based models for storm surge risk assessment in a changing climate. 
and this was also discussed as well the yeah. role of science the uh, role of science communication yeah science uh, communication yeah, yeah. Th- th- there was a nice discussion about the um language used yeah. for scientists and it was something that scientists was also were also yeah. thinking about um in terms of what they terms that they yeah. can use for this and yeah. at the same time um the in terms in archaeology uh we also have some studies not necessarily yeah. on disaster but on the changing uh effects of uh settlements and uh yeah. changing effects of settlements to in the environment so uh we would love to uh hear from you again ruchi uh, yeah. when when are you expected to finish this dissertation <laughs> I guess that's the last question that we have. Yeah, yeah. So probably, uh, well, I have like four years to do this. All right. But, okay. Uh, but but I I really want to you know uh probably I'll try to have like uh get it out piece by piece. Uh well I, I well um well the, well the thing like I'm always reminded of like the nature of history as what say uh it's four beers would say or like. It's the, the like uh, uh, Edmund Carr and um, say Louis Gottschalk, all these you know uh, early early scholars of historiography. That history among the disciplines is you know it straddles between social sciences and humanities, and I guess now with like environmental historians, we have the duty also to you know to connect. Natural sciences, natural oh, yeah. sciences with humanities and also with social sciences, because um, because we are looking not only at people, we are also looking at nature, and uh, to and why we look at it, we need to be able to you know to create, uh, I think digestible narratives. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the digestible narratives that any person could understand, that any person could derive lessons from, and uh, and also that any person could interact and engage. Because um, we need to un- we need to um, we need to understand that uh, scientists, scholars should not be in the position. To impose knowledge, especially for people who actually live these truths, who live these experiences, mm-hmm. and that's why it should be able to, you know, it should be when um, when there is, like, say, um, a release of these materials, they, there should be some sort of dialogue between oh, the yeah. scholar and the people. Okay, Definitely. because yeah, uh, it. It allows the scholar to learn more from the people, and at the same time, the people also to learn from the scholar, and that's how it should be. Uh, you know, and it's a well, being a public academic is a very tiresome task, especially in the age of misinformation and fake news. But we, we have, yes, <laughs> and that, I guess that's also a nice way to. And this as a challenge, yeah, yeah, yeah. and to ourselves as well. Yeah, yeah. It's always a challenge. It's always a challenge. Yeah. We we need we need and we need to challenge ourselves. Oh yeah, Definitely. yeah, yeah. Because if That's not, if if because even challenge. if like, okay, we are you want you want to choose a challenge le- challenge less life, nature will challenge you. <laughs> uh we have to yeah. put that in a bigger uh, poster. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, thank routine. you. Thank you also, Anna. And thank you, ev- thank yeah. you to everyone who uh, attended as well. Uh, next week, we're still uh, checking if we will have a binalot um, yeah. or we will have a break. Uh, next, The next Wednesday will be on November 2. Some of uh, us might be uh, visiting uh, relatives, but at the same time, maybe we can still hold this. Uh, last week's binalot was... Uh, uh, canceled because of the speakers uh, uh, not being available, but we'll try to reschedule that. 
but in the meantime, uh, if you want to check out the future Binalo Talks, please check out our uh, Binalo Talks Facebook page. You can also um, check out the UP Archaeological Studies Program Facebook page where the Binalot is also uh, posted. Uh, and then if you have any questions for our speaker, you can email him. He put his email at yeah, the yeah. chat. I'm right. very glad when people try to, you know, because really, uh, if the, the, you know, the advantage if you have a discussions, you're oh, not yeah. the only one doing the thinking. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a lot of things that come yeah. out. Yeah, you have you you know you yeah. you uh, you you make you make you, you stagger yeah. the intellectual and the mental load. Oh, definitely. Yes. Yeah, and that that really helps. Yeah, that yeah. really helps. Yeah. All right. Uh, but thank you, Ruchi. Uh, thank to you, everyone. Thank you. We will see you next week, hopefully, or we watch out for yeah. some announcements. Uh, yeah. Ruchi, we will, if we can, we will try to invite you again on, yeah, if, sure. even if you're there in Australia, we'll find a way. <laughs> we always enjoy our chats with you. Yeah. So. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Like, thank send you. my regards to everyone. Like, we will. All yeah. right. Thank you so much and goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye.